morning. As you have your seats, we're going to remind you this week, or this month, excuse me, is Pastor Appreciation Month here at Peerless, and we're so excited to honor them and continue today. First, I want to remind you, to last next week is the last week to bring cards to place in the box there in the back of the room um, to show your appreciation and we would really encourage you to do so. Don't forget. But I also want to challenge you, don't just do it this month. All year long, let's make sure that we're reaching out and letting them know how much we appreciate them, showing up to support them when they need help. Let's cheer them on and, and let them know. Um, today, we are going to... Um, we're going to honor our children's pastors, Lee and Kathy Bagley. I'd like to ask you guys to come and stand up. Also... Yes, also our worship pastors, John and Lindsay Miller. And also we want to ask Kristen and Dylan Goins to come on up, our nursery and preschool pastors. We want to, we want to love on them too. Um, so we have a little gift for them, just a little something to show how much we love them. And I just want to say a few things to each of them. John and Lindsay... Thank you for using your gifts and talents to bless our church and lead us in all the aspects of worship. Um, you do it with excellence. And you spend a lot of time not just preparing and practicing with the band and the choir and doing all the things with your team, but you also spend a lot of time in prayer. And that makes all the difference. And we, we really appreciate you. You have a heart for the prodigal and the weary and you're always pursuing ways to help us encounter God in our, in our worship time and through music. We love your family, and we appreciate, and we're so blessed to have you here at Peerless Church. Thank you, Kathy and Lee. I just want to say, you guys, you have served 19 years. This is your 19th year at Peerless Church. I would venture to say that's probably the longest any pastor has served in this church at Peerless Road Church. So uh, that alone deserves a huge applause. Um, but we, we're so blessed that you are the shepherd for our children. Um, on Sunday mornings and Awana's on Wednesday nights and Summer Spark and all, all, all the other things during the year that you guys prepare and plan and accomplish. And also the never ending task of recruiting and leading our volunteers. That's a huge task in itself. And you guys do that with excellence as well. And I just want to say thank you. Your ministry space is always ever changing to adapt to what, what you're sharing and, and keeping up with um, ministering to the, the kids in, in fresh and new ways, teaching them the good news of our Savior. And you love our children and our community so well. And we just so appreciate the sacrifices and all of the things that you give and you pour out onto our kids. And then Miss Dylan and Miss, or Mr. Dylan and, excuse me, Dylan and Kristen. I just want to say thank you. Um, we are so grateful for what you guys do here for the littles of Peerless Church. Um, your work is not easy, but it's so important, right, church? So important. Um, the babies and toddlers and preschoolers here are learning about the God that created them and loves them so much. And they get that every time they walk in the doors. And, and that comes through your leadership. Um, you work tirelessly to fill all the roles needed. And um, church, please, please help. Yes. They need help. Yeah. The, the harvest is ripe in that nursery and preschool and toddler room. But the laborers are very few. And it's, it's time that we step up and help them um, just once a month. Spend some time in there loving on our babies. They need it. And we thank you so much for making a huge difference in there and through the sacrifices that you guys make every day here at church. Um, and then to all of you, even you, um, I know that this past year has been really hard. And there's been some very big challenges in your ministry and there's also been moments where you questioned if you could continue. And I'm here to say thank you. And I can't do this without her. Um, thank you for staying. Thank you for praying and trusting God and for being faithful to your calling and to those that you shepherd. I know that God will bless your faithfulness and your ministries. 
And again, I'm not the only one that feels this way. We're gonna share, we're gonna share a video. Thank you. Love you. Thanks to Caitlin Lamb, we also have some friends that want to say how much they love you. So we're going to play a little video. I appreciate Don and Lindsay for their continuous uh, commitment to our church inside and outside. I love John and Lindsay because they make choir so much fun. John is like the musical genius, and Lindsay is the most fabulous singer that I have ever met, and we just love and cherish everything about you guys. Thank you for all you do. We're thankful for John and Lindsay because of all the creative freedom they give us. Very thankful. It's been really, really great. You can't wait to see all the other stuff you have planned for our worship. It's, it, you, lead, you lead it so just amazingly, and I'm just so thankful to be a part of it. I am thankful for John and Lindsay because they continuously pour into us and encourage us not to be worship leaders, but to be worshipers. You guys are basically my family, and I love you so much, and you do so much for our church, and I appreciate it. We love you, John and Lindsay. Appreciate you so much and all you do. Hey, guys, we appreciate all the time you put in that no one will ever see and how you lead our ministry. Thank you. John and Lindsay, I just want to thank you for welcoming me in the choir. Uh, I'm not a very good singer, but you, you all say that I am, so that really means a lot. So thank you all and love y'all. Hey, we appreciate John and Lindsay just because they, they bring us together and just help us to, to grow as a, a band and a choir, and it's, it's a blast. What he said. Hey, John and Lindsay, thank you for all you've done, and thank you for taking me through the mentoring process for the worship. Uh, we really appreciate all that you do. John and Lindsay, we love you so much. You make uh, leading worship and helping you in worship so easy to do. We appreciate you guys very much. Steve, we just love your spirit. I love the fact that you pray over every set and that it's so passionate within you. And you keep telling all the all the people that are on your team, you're like, if God moves and you feel like you need to go pray, well, then just go do that because God will work it all out. We love your ministry. What he said. John and Lindsay, thank you so much for all the hard work that you guys do. Your ministry does not go unnoticed. Thank you for all the hours you put in to prepare all the music, and we appreciate your part tracks, John. I'm really thankful for John and Lindsay. They enter into the presence of the Lord every Sunday, and it blesses my heart. Also, I love receiving text messages from Lindsay throughout my week sometimes just to encourage me, and it means a lot to me. I think she has a true pastor's heart. I love Kathy and Lee. Who doesn't love Kathy and Lee? Sister Kathy, I love you. Brother Lee, I love you. <laughs> thank you for loving my kid, and thank you for loving all of our kids. You guys do a fantastic job, and also with the mission work that you guys do is incredible. I hope that I am as young as you guys are when I'm your age. I love you, Miss Lee and Miss Kathy. I love Miss Kathy because she's very sweet um, and very nice, and she's very generous, and she puts people before herself. Thanks and shout out to Miss Kathy and <laughs> we love you, Miss Kathy, because you're so and sweet to us. And you, and you teach me a lot of stuff. Wow. She's so fun and she helps me a lot to learn about Jesus. Because they're nice teachers. Miss Kathy and Mr. Lee are really fun with all the get fun games. I like how Miss Kathy it's teaching church, but makes it fun, and Mr. Lee helps out a lot. I like Miss Kathy and Mr. Lee because they help me learn a lot. I appreciate Miss Kathy and Mr. Lee because they're great pastors, and I love them. We love Miss Kathy. We love Pastor Kathy. I appreciate Miss Kathy because she is kind and she has her hardest to help us keep us learning about the Lord. I am so thankful for Pastor Kathy and Lee Baggerly. They do such great ministry here at Peerless Shore Church, and they love the kids. I appreciate working with them every single day. I appreciate Pastors Lee and Kathy Baggerly for all they do for our family, for all of our children, and the discipleship and the growth that each of my kids have as part of your ministry. Thank you. Dada. We love you, Miss Kristen and, and Miss Dylan. Thank you, friend. Uh, Who are we going to see? KK and No No. KK and No No? Yeah, I love them. You love them? Yes.
Thank you guys. We love you so much. Well, thank you um, on behalf of all of the pastoral staff. You're an easy church to love. So thank you for, for honoring us and making us feel special today. Are you ready this morning to enter into worship? I am ready. The choir is going to make their way up this morning. And as they're coming, I'd like to invite us to open up with a time of prayer. So I'm going to invite you just where you're at, wherever you are, if you would just join me in asking the Lord to have his way in the service this morning, as well as to open our hearts, open our ears to what he has. Let us pray this morning. Father, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to come boldly into your presence. We thank you this morning that we have the opportunity to not only share the gospel, but receive the gospel this morning. Lord, we ask that you would pour your spirit out special upon us this morning, that anyone that may be tuning in either here or on live stream, God, would have an encounter and an experience with you. This morning, we speak specifically to the prodigals and to anyone that might not have yet received the love of Jesus. And we say, welcome home. There is a place for you at the table of Christ. There is a place for you in our community, in our congregation, and there is a place for you at Jesus' feet. So this morning we pray, God, that you would open up the windows of heaven and pour out your glory on us this morning. In Jesus' precious and holy name, have your way. can yet sing but if we sing long enough they might join in with us and this may be a dance that's too heavy for those chains but if we dance long enough all oh, the prisons will open up this may be a shout that those fragile lungs can bear but if out long enough or oh, the walls might finally fall and they may need some help to lift their hands up in the air but we know there's freedoms coming so we'll sing it all the more we'll sing it all. Yeah. 
his freedom. Open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in his freedom. So open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. Sing, there is joy. There is true joy in his freedom. So open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe in. Jesus, Jesus. There is true joy in his freedom. So open your heart and receive it. There is a hope to believe shift our focus this morning to those people that we're asking to come home, that we're welcoming to come home. Maybe it's you this morning that we're saying, have you been burdened long enough? Have you been walking around in shame? The beautiful thing about Jesus is his love for you cannot change and it's something that you can't change with anything that you do. There is grace and there is mercy and there is love this morning. There is peace in his presence. So maybe this morning you didn't come because you needed a touch from God, but maybe there is somebody you know that did. Or maybe there is someone that you need to focus your worship on this morning. Of course, we, we, we focus our worship on Jesus. But sometimes we have to pray for those around us through our worship and dance a little harder and sing a little louder. So this morning, we're asking you, Holy Spirit, pour your spirit out. We know, Lord Jesus, that you are the only thing that can change anything. So God, we ask you, we submit to you and we are in obedience, just like those walls around Jericho came down. They came down because of the obedience of the people that listened in submission. Just like Naaman who went down into the water seven times, not just six, because he was obedient to what you told him to do. So God, this morning, I pray that you would pour your spirit out on us. You've been down long enough, no more.
more walking in shame Cause the way that he loves you Is it something you can change? You've been running in circles But you can't hide from grace Cause the way that he loves you Is it something you can change? You've been down long enough No more walking in shame Cause the way that he loves you Is it something you can change? You've been running in circles But you can't hide from grace Cause the way that he loves you Is it something you can change? Just like Lazarus out of that
He's been waiting. Can you hear it? He's been knock, knock, knocking. Roll back that stone. Roll back that stone. Roll back that stone. Just like Lazarus out of that grave, our oh, God rewrites history. Jesus, you change everything when you pour your spirit out. Just like Silas singing with Paul, please can't break down prison walls. Jesus, you can have it all. Won't you pour your spirit out? Pour your spirit out. Pour your spirit Your 
Jesus. We know that it's at your name. Jesus. Hallelujah. We just speak that name. We say Jesus. Jesus. We speak it from the mountains. We speak it from the hills. We speak it over our families. We speak it over every lost prodigal this morning. Jesus. Say it with me. Say Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Call on his name. Hallelujah. 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 We speak Jesus this morning. Jesus is the answer. that we use in the Church of God of Prophecy and we say we're going to reconcile the world to Christ. That's our mission. I know we sometimes get wrapped up in what we do just here in this local body and we do a lot of great things, but did you know that in the Church of God of Prophecy we're in over 135 nations, over a million members worldwide, do you know that the largest growing Pentecostal area in the world is China, with over 10,000 people turning to Christianity a day? And we're part of that. And we do it by speaking Jesus. We speak Jesus to the mountains. Now, how does that get done? Let me tell you something. In just the last two weeks, we've had some of our leaders who are in the Ukraine and Belarus and Russian area that have been interrogated for over eight hours because they're speaking the name of Jesus. We have a national leader in Pakistan who was beaten by a mob. They tried to set him on fire. And somehow, miraculously, he got up and ran away because he's speaking Jesus. This morning, as we go into our time of offering, we're going to take up a special offering because the question is, is how do we do that? How do we reconcile the world to Christ? We do it through missions. We do it through our leadership across this world people that are putting their lives on the line every day. And this morning, we're going to take some time and we're going to think about what it is to be in their shoes, to speak Jesus. If you want to make connection with them, this July, July 31st through August 4th, we're doing our International Assembly. Now what is that? That's the time when we take to bring these 135 global leaders in so that we can sit down with them and we can strategize about how best to spread the gospel to the world. They come in before the assembly and they meet and they have all these meetings and then we go into a time of celebration. And we're going to celebrate what the Lord is doing. And we get reports from all over the world, and we'll be announcing those at the assembly about the work that is being done. Now, I don't know if you know it, but when we go into a nation, we just don't go in there and we just try and put a leader in there. What we do is we try and raise up indigenous people who are living in that area, who know those people, and who work every day hand in hand with them. And when they do, it's miraculous. What they do on a daily basis, it's just unbelievable when you hear their stories. So if you do, if you want to take part of that, let me tell you that it costs you only your hotel room. That's it to come to the assembly. We don't charge an entrance fee. We don't, we don't have to buy a ticket for it. You can go there. That's this July 31st through the 4th in Orlando, Florida. But it also takes money to put this on. So how do we do that? Every year, we ask churches to take up an offering and to participate in this great call to reconcile the world to Christ. You can participate this morning. What's it cost?
Would you believe it costs over a million dollars to do all of that? That's airfare, that's food, that's, that's helping different missions get there and how, how those missionaries are brought there. And we, it takes money. Unfortunately, the, the world is not going to cut us a discount. But I know a God who, <laughs> I know a God that is able. I'm not asking you to give $1,000 or a $1 million. I'm asking you to participate. With over a million members, if each one would just give $1, we'd have it paid for in one time. I'm asking you to participate by thinking of these leaders that you're helping to bring in to provide them with clothes and food, to provide for the expenses. If you can't make it, can I encourage you to watch it? We stream every minute, every moment of the entire assembly. And if you want to really hone in on one time, Saturday morning, our presiding bishop, Brother Tim Coulter, who we're so glad to have you, he's here. Every time we're here, he's here supporting us. Whenever he's not traveling, he's here. He's got grandkids here. And we're kind of pulling him in here. But Saturday morning, he's going to cast his vision for the entire worldwide movement. Because we're going to reconcile the world to Christ. And you can participate. Every head bowed as the ushers are coming. Lord, we thank you this morning for what you're doing, for allowing us, Lord, to speak Jesus. Lord, let us all speak Jesus. As we come together and as we bond and lift each other up, we pray, Lord, for our leaders across this world, Lord, that go through persecution every day. And we say, Lord, let us just be a part in speaking your name so that everyone will be reconciled to you. And Lord, we thank you for what you're doing. And as we prepare, Lord, to give, may it be for your glory, for your honor, for we speak Jesus to the nations. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. that name rest upon us and work through us, I pray, for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for being with us this morning. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah. Turn with me to James chapter 3. As you're turning there, I'll mention a few things. James chapter 3. Tonight at 5 o'clock is our senior service. Reverend David Riggs will be sharing tonight, so I hope you'll join us here in the sanctuary. All are welcome to come join us tonight at 5 o'clock with David Riggs. Um, this weekend, we've got some things going on, yard sale and silent auction on Friday and Saturday for our missions team. Saturday at 9, 9 a.m. is our monthly men's breakfast, if you want to join us in the hospitality room. And Saturday at 1 p.m. is our Women of the Word gathering. Uh, see the bulletin for more information on that. That happens monthly as well. 
And coming up Sunday, May 5th is graduation Sunday, so if you have a graduate or you are graduating, no matter what age you are, we have lots of people going through lots of different um, courses now at any age of life, so if you're graduating from some sort of course or, or school, then let Pastor Josh know and we will make sure to honor you on that day. I've got a senior coming up and we're, it's the first one, so we're preparing for our first senior day and graduation and all the things that go with that uh, and all the tears that come along with it, uh, so we're trying to be prepared for that. And then, of course, don't forget, May 12th is Mother's Day. It's coming up. Mark your calendars, guys, children. Make sure you know what you can do for mama on that day. I'll reiterate, we need nursery workers. Um, I hope you'll pray about that. You saw Dylan and Kristen up here. They need help. Um, and we've got more than enough opportunity and availability here. Uh, so we, we shouldn't be struggling in this arena. So I'll just encourage you to say a prayer today and, and say, Lord, do you need me to help back there? And if we could just have enough to just, just for once a month is all, is all we'd hope to have you do. So check in with Dylan and Kristen if you feel so moved by God to help us in that area. I'm excited to say that next week we're going to start talking about what we're going to do with that sanctuary over there. Uh, we met with the board in the last couple of weeks, and uh, we're going to begin talking about how we're going to get there next week in our capital campaign as we talk about three-year pledges that we're going to begin taking. We're going to talk about uh, the ideas of listen and pray and pledge in uh, a capital campaign we're calling Build Your Church. So we're going to start talking about that next week, and over the course of the next several weeks, we'll be talking about it. You'll hear more information about what's coming. We're meeting with uh, the builder here in the next few weeks to get more information information, hopefully a rendering to bring to you and discuss all of the things that go with that. So we'll begin talking about that next week and over the course of the next several weeks. And then on June 2nd, Lord willing, is the day we'll begin pledging and saying this is how we're going to get there. So I would ask you to begin praying for that even now. We'll begin that next week. But here today, we're not beginning that yet. Today we're talking about our words. We talked about speaking the name of Jesus. It'd be great if that's all we actually spoke, wouldn't it? Uh, maybe not. We might not ever get anything done if all we said was Jesus. We actually have to say other things. Unfortunately, in all the other words we say, we often say a whole lot more than things Jesus would have said. And so we're going to look at that today. James chapter 3, as we talk about how to extinguish your fire-breathing dragon. Now, I wish I had one in the backyard. It'd be great if I had a fire-breathing dragon in the backyard. It'd be my pet. I would love it. I, 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 I'd, I'd toy with it and pet it and, and show it off. Uh, unfortunately, the fire-breathing dragons don't live in the backyard. They live in our mouths, as James 3 points out. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? James 3, starting in verse 1. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. Woe is me as I begin to teach you. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses or to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal or take ships as an example. Although they're so large and are driven by strong winds, they're steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. Father, we love you today. Thank you again for your presence in our midst. Let your word take deep root in our hearts and produce much fruit. And once again, as always, don't let my imperfections, which are so many, stand in the way of your perfection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When I was, oh geez, it was probably 15 years ago, 16, maybe 17, I had been at the international offices where I worked uh, for nearly 18 years before stepping into this position, pastored a couple churches along the way, um, but I'd been there for just a year or so, and one of my friends that worked there had gotten married. Some of you will identify her as I begin to talk, because you're going to know the story, but I won't mention her name, because she's not here to defend herself. Uh, but uh, as we were playing softball, I noticed that, that my friend was back in town. She had gotten married a few months earlier and then moved away, and suddenly she was back in town with the so watching softball with her and another friend that, that I'd, I'd gone to college with. And uh, as I'm leaving the softball field, I, I found myself talking to her a little bit as we were walking back to the car, 
And uh, I, I, have, I have this bad, this bad way of sarcasm being my go-to for my response to everything. I apologize for all the moments I've done this with you. And if I haven't done it with you yet, I apologize now in advance for when I do. It will happen. I'm convinced that curiosity did not kill the cat. I believe sarcasm is what actually killed the cat because I've killed a lot of cats in my life with my sarcasm. So I, I, I had this sarcastic comment that I, I had this run through my head and, and I, I, I used, used to, I didn't have a filter. I've learned over the years to have a little filter by God's grace and the help of my wife in my ear saying, why did you say that? Don't say it again. <laughs> but I had this sarcastic comment run through my head and I did actually filter it and I thought, surely it's okay to say. Is it okay to say? And I thought, she's only been married three months. Surely it's okay to say. So I let the sarcastic comment fall out. I said, well, you're home, what do you, what do you home for we're just seeing seeing my family and her husband wasn't with her so the sarcastic comment came out well did you already leave your husband and the the air just got lifted out of the entire parking lot when her response was well actually and I wanted I was carrying my ball glove I wanted to stuff myself into my baseball glove and throw my entire self into the garbage can as I walked by it because I was I was just beside myself like sure there's no way how how did that happen my tongue had started a fire. Thankfully, the next day, her and her friend were, were telling me and Christy that I gave them a wonderful laugh for the night because of my, my, my response in the moment of my embarrassment because my sarcasm had just skinned the cat in the room. The tongue is a powerful thing, and it can get us into trouble faster than juicy gossip in our atrium can. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been or what you've done or what your calling is. We all trip over this thing we call the tongue from time to time, sometimes worse than other times. None of us are immune. So if you're sitting here today and you've just relaxed thinking, oh, he's talking about the tongue, I can relax. I assure you, you can't. If you're thinking this isn't for you, then I assure you that you're exactly who this is for. And so we're looking at James 3 and 4 for his take on this thing today, this tongue. And so the first thing we have to consider is this question, which James answers for us, is how would you define the perfect Christian? How would you define the perfect, what kind of things would come to mind if you would say, what would make the perfect Christian perfect? James 3 and 2 gives us an answer. If anyone is never at fault in what he says, he is perfect. And the next line is the kicker. And he's able to keep his whole body in check. Never at fault in what you say makes you perfect. James says the perfect Christian is the one who controls his or her tongue. And by controlling our tongues, we can then control the entire body, it says. Christian perfection defined by what we say? That seems like a new idea. That's one I don't hear very often. As we move through this passage, you're going to notice that we'll see James making correlations between our words and our actions. We'll also see him taking snapshots, small images, and expanding them to much larger pictures and images. So walk through this with me as the first thing I need you to hear is simply this. Stifle your evil yapper. Some of you remember the word stifle. Some of you don't. Who remembers All in the Family? Who, who grew up watching All in the Family? Who's never heard of All in the Family? Okay. <laughs> so, I don't recommend looking it up. There are a lot of cultural references that are not, are not acceptable today. Uh, but it was okay in its day. And one of the things that Archie Bunker, the main character, would say to his wife, Edith, when she would get going with her, with her yapper or would begin talking a little too much, he would say, stifle, Edith, stifle. He was just saying, control your tongue and yourself. James 3, 3 and 4 says, when we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. James jumps right in, pointing out the extreme power of his tiny tongue. And please note, it has power. There are some in the religious sector who will say the tongue holds all power. They say you can speak things into existence. Just say it, and name it, and claim it, and, and, and blab it, and grab it, as some say. And it's, it's often referred to as the prosperity gospel of we can say it, and by saying it, there are some who will say that the tongue holds all the power. I don't agree with that. Some in the word of faith movement believe that our words trigger our faith. But I don't go that far. I don't believe it's your words that trigger your faith. I believe it's your faith that triggers your words. So just speaking it doesn't mean you believe it. You say it because you believe it. So the words aren't the thing of power. It's the faith in my God that creates things. 
I say a lot of things I don't believe because I'm often thinking out loud and I'm arguing with myself even while I'm talking to others. So here's what we need to know. My words don't drive my faith. My faith drives my words and thus simply speaking things doesn't bring them to pass. I believe and trust in God and he brings things to pass. So words don't contain power to create. We don't have power to speak things into existence. We speak in faith, and God brings things into existence. I don't do it. My words don't do it. God does it. The power lies in God, not in my words. And yet, while some overemphasize the power of the tongue, I, in the same breath, don't want to underemphasize the power of the tongue. Because this little yapper holds quite a bit of power and influence, particularly over the course of our lives, as James will point out. Where we land is often the result of what we have said. Where we find ourselves in life is often the result of things we have said. Because our tongue steers our lives in a certain direction. James point out, points out here that there's two analogies given to pertain to the overarching power of the tongue and how it directs the course of our lives. He calls it two things. He says it's like a bit in a horse's mouth and it's like a rudder on a ship. Now, those both paint vivid images of a tiny contraption controlling the direction of a much larger object. And you should note that both of them are all about steering A bit in a horse's mouth determines where it goes as you hold it and move it and manipulate it. And the rudder on a ship determines where the ship goes as the captain holds it and moves it and manipulates it. And so James is telling us the tongue can steer the direction of your life. But there's more to it than just that because when we say the tongue can steer the direction of our life, it sounds good, but it's not the complete truth. Read this again. When we say the tongue turns the direction of our life, it's not totally true. Look what it says, verse 3. When we put bits in the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. So while the tongue is likened to a bit in a horse's mouth and a rudder on a ship, in both instances, it makes it abundantly clear someone is controlling the bit and someone is steering the rudder. So when your horse goes down the wrong path or your ship smacks into the low-hanging bridge, there's always someone at the helm. The bit didn't make the horse go the wrong way, and the rudder didn't steer the ship into the bridge. The person holding the wheel and the reins was the reason for the wreck. Who is that? That's you, and that's me. Who's holding the bit in the horse's mouth of our tongue? It's you, and it's me. Who's the captain of the ship that determines which way that rudder turns so that the ship goes a certain direction? It's you, and it's me. So when our tongue goes awry and we find it steering us into the bridge, it's not the tongue's fault, it's my fault. So when we talk about controlling the tongue, we have to understand it steers the whole body like a rudder on the ship, but I hold the wheel. The tongue only says what I want it to say, although sometimes I'm not certain, certain that's totally the case because I seem to, things fall out of my mouth that I didn't ever want to fall out of my mouth. Somebody say amen. But I'm still holding that wheel, or at least I'm left holding the wheel thinking, why did it turn that direction? <laughs> so if you, if you find yourself heading in the wrong direction, you need to check one thing. What have I been saying? We look to so many cultural influences that we think are driving us in certain ways. We find ourselves in situations we don't want to be, and we feel like we've been driven in that by some force outside of ourselves. And so often I think we need to look in the mirror and say, what have I been saying? What words have been coming out of my mouth that have led me to where I am? James says, this is what's controlling the direction of your life. You know, when you start the conversation with, well, I probably shouldn't say this, but you probably shouldn't say it. (laughs) When you have to preface what you're about to say with the fact that you shouldn't say it, don't say it. All your negative moments, all those gossip sessions, all those pity parties, all the emotional reactions spoken in anger and fear and hurt, they're all directing the course of your life. So if you find yourself today in a place you never wanted to be and you feel like you've ended up following a path you didn't intend to follow, you need to ask yourself, and more importantly, you need to ask the Holy Spirit, God, what have I been saying? Show me the words that have been coming out of my mouth that are steering the course of my life. 
But our words don't only affect our lives. And here's the big trage- tragedy of this all. Because our words don't only affect our lives. They also affect the lives of all those within earshot. Because the words spoken aren't just for me to hear. They're always for somebody else to hear too. And James makes this point in verse 3 and, and t- No human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. No human can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of dead... Two two things mentioned here of the tongue. It's a restless evil and it's deadly poison. Now that word restless in the original Greek means unstable. An unstable evil. It gives you the image of kind of walking up on uh, finding a World War II bomb. If you walked up on it, you realize it's there and it never detonated. You'd be scared to death of what might happen. If you were to just touch it the wrong way or bump it the wrong way or move it the wrong way, and this is what's likened to our tongue. Just move it. The, can I get another microphone? If you just touch it, bump it, move it the wrong way, it can explode in your face. Sam was coming from the hallway and not there to help me when I needed him. (laughs) He was running from the door. (laughs) I think I've said the only time you notice those people in the back is when they don't do the job they're supposed to do. It's the only time you recognize them is when they get it wrong. As long as they get it right, you never know they're there. (laughs) <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Good to see you today. So glad you're here to help us. Don't walk away on me. I still need you. You see what just happened? Sarcasm fell out of my mouth. I'm a, I'm a direct illustration of everything I'm preaching about. It's like an unstable bomb that can go off at any moment. We carry this live bomb in our mouths, and so we have to handle it with care. I can't throw around a live grenade all willy nilly. I can't just chuck it in the audience and see what happens and hope for the best. That's what happens when the words just start falling out. And so it says it's a restless evil. It's like, it's like an old undetonated bomb. And it's full of deadly poison. It's, it's poisonous. Now, I mentioned that we, we speak and we're just not the ones hearing it. There's always someone else listening. And this is what kind of, it's likened to deadly poison because poison only hurts the one injected. Poison doesn't hurt the injector. The one injecting the poison is never hurt by the poison. Only the one who gets injected is hurt by the poison. So our constant negativity towards what's going on is more often hurting others who might otherwise be okay. It's not hurting me as much as it's hurting everyone else I'm spewing it out to. And this is what grieves me so deeply about this evil of our tongues. The people spewing the poison aren't the ones getting hurt. The ones they are injecting are the ones getting hurt. Who are you injecting with your words? What's falling out of your mouth? What negativity? What undetonated bomb are you chucking into the audience and just hoping for the best? Because I'll tell you, that bomb is going off and you're injecting people around you who would otherwise be okay and suddenly they're being dragged into your own negativity and they're being moved and if your life is going the wrong direction, don't make their lives go there too. It's full of deadly poison. One person can plant a seed that forever hurts another person. Can't tell you how often I remember in my upbringing the rumors that would start, and they'd often turn out to be completely untrue, but before you could ever realize they were untrue, someone had gotten upset at someone else, and they, so de- they, they would desperately, deliberately start a rumor and plant seeds of negativity, and before you know it, a perfectly good person would be viewed as perfectly evil because someone planted a seed of negativity that went unchecked and tainted everyone else's view. This ties in closely to what James says in verse 5. There's one more analogy given by James. He said a restless evil and a deadly poison. Verse 5, he says, Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what great a forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the course 
the whole course of one's life on fire and is itself set on fire by hell. Now, that's a pretty, a pretty daunting image. When I was a kid, sometimes I'd pretend to be that fire-breathing dragon, but here James' main point is we're all fire-breathing dragons. We all carry around this, this, this spark in our tongues that's capable of starting an entire fire. The Greek here, again, is rather interesting. It says a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. In the original language, the word for forest isn't necessarily what we picture for forest. It's more of a term for low-lying brush, not large trees. So the images of a brush fire or low-lying fire that spreads really rapidly. When I was 18, before I left for college, before I determined what I was going to do, I actually uh, was trained as a, as a forestry firefighter so that I could fly out west and fight those fires that go off about every summer. And uh, I never got to go, but I went through all of the training before I went to college. I had been in college a week or two when I got my first call to go out there and actually make some money, but I couldn't go. But I had all the training, and I learned that brush fires are, are often much more dangerous and more rapidly spreading than actual forest fires. Those low-lying brush fires can move much more rapidly. Uh, a large forest fire is more easily containable. You, you, you dig trenches, and you, and you cut lines, and you can get it to stop, and it, it won't as easily jump those lines, but a low-lying brush fire is much harder to contain and spreads much more quickly. One wildland firefighter had this to say about such a fire. He said, a wildfire differs from other fires by its size and the speed at which it can spread out from its original source and its ability to change direction unexpectedly at any given moment. And this is what the, t the fire in our tongues is likened to. This uncontrollable raging fire that we can start with one little spark, with one little word, with one little comment, with one little response, with one little claim of sarcasm. And suddenly you can't, con it's out of control before you even know it. And now I, I got to start meddling. Because when we begin to talk about the tongue as a rapidly spreading wildfire, I think it's pretty easy to make the correlation of what James is getting at. It's a tiny little sin that's so prevalent in the church, and we used to hear a lot of, about it a lot, that word gossip. Yeah, it's funny how when you start to talk about words, nobody says any words in the congregation. <laughs> talk about words, you'll always get silence. Our state overseer, Paul Holt, says there are two acceptable sins in our church. They're gluttony and gossip. Gossip, the dictionary says, is a rumor, chatty talk. The Bible would describe it this way. A gossip is one who reveals secrets. One who goes about as a talebearer or scandal monger. I like that term. Scandal monger. Mongering the scandal. A gossiper is a per who, person who has privileged information about people and proceeds to reveal that information to others who have no business knowing it, injecting deadly poison, starting rapid wildfires. I've talked to my wife about this scenario in years past, and she tells me that sometimes there's a desire to be the bearer and disseminator of information. Some want to be the hub. It's not always about talking bad about other people behind their backs, although that's the obvious way to define gossip. But it can also be about wanting to obtain all the information and then wanting to be the one who shares all the information to make sure that you're in the know, that you're in the hub. For some, it's about feeling important, knowing everybody's business, feeling like you're always in the know and needing everyone else to know that you're always in the know. If you find that everyone comes to you when they have a question about what's going on in someone else's life, you just might be the gossip of the group. I'm reminded of a story John Maxwell told in a leadership lesson many years ago. He told about a woman in his church who was a gossip and a source of division, starting a lot of fires that they couldn't put out or had a difficult time putting out. And he and another leader confronted her and asked her why she was spreading such awful stories. Most of her stories were half-truths. She said, I can't help it. People just tell me these stories and I have to share them. After a long silence, John Maxwell said, do you know why people take their trash to the dump? She was taken aback. She said, not really. John said, because they accept it there. He said, the day they stop accepting trash, people will stop going there to drop it off. 
The day you stop accepting all the rumors, the day you stop accepting all the information, the day you stop needing to be in the know will be the day it stops coming to you again and again and again. There are moments when we need information. And when we get that information, you know what we should be? Information door stops. Then it's not about gossip. But if you're an information green light, then you better be real careful with what you do with that green light. Because you're carrying an unstable bomb in your mouth. You're carrying a little spark that can start a fire that before you know it will be out of control. And you will have lots of regrets once that fire starts. So James has been talking a lot about fire. And how our tongue is a fire. And how it's set on fire by hell itself. (laughs) There's a little pilot light on those gas stoves, right? And it's always burning. And that gas comes from some source, and it always has to be there. So if you have something gas in your house, there's always a flame burning of some sort. It's called the pilot light. And we have this little pilot light in our mouths. You know where the gas that that charges it comes from? It comes from hell itself. That's what keeps that little thing burning inside your mouth. That's why we got to be so careful of what comes out when we open it. He says it's set on fire by hell itself. So how can we ever hope to control this wicked fire-breathing dragon we all have inside of us? How do we hope to control something that's set on fire by hell itself? Well, James gives us an answer, and turns out it's pretty simple. You use the same thing everyone else uses to put out a fire. You use water. Look to verse 9 of James 3. As I tell you the second thing today, stifle your evil, the yapper, and the second thing is draw from the wellspring of life to learn how to control your fire-breathing dragon. James 3, verse 9, it says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. What's James talking about with this gushing of water in springs? He's telling us how to put out the fire. A spring is the outpouring of something below ground. A spring is the bubbling up of something beneath the surface. So what is James saying? you got to get to the source to be able to manage the fire. you got to get down to the source to find the right water to be able to put out the fire. But if you're trying to dig down and get fresh water, but you keep tapping a saltwater well, it's time to dig a new well. You're looking in the wrong place. Interestingly, this word in the NIV translates salt water. In the original language, is more appropriately translated as bitter water. Some of your translations may even say bitter water. It's used again in 314, just a few verses later, talking about bitter envy and selfish ambition. So if you're trying to dig down and get fresh, pure water to extinguish the fire-breathing dragon within, but you keep tapping bitter waters... Of past hurts and pains, your fire will not be extinguished. If there's ever any hope of extinguishing the fires in our lives, we must stop tapping bitter wells. Wells of bitterness will only cause us to spew even more fire from the horribly evil tongue. If you're drawing water from the well of bitterness, it's time to dig a new well. It's time to find a new source because that bitter water is not going to put out the fire of your tongue that's set on fire by hell itself. You're finding yourself hating your life and hating your job and hating your routine and hating everyone else. You've got the wrong source. If you're spouting off negativity every time you get a text you don't like or a task you don't like or a responsibility you don't like, you're drawing from the wrong well. You need to dig a new well. you got to go to a different source. How do we do it? How do we change our attitudes? How do we go about digging new wells? you got to go to the right source. We've got to pull from the proper source. But how do we do it? We have to stop spewing our negativity to everyone around us, starting fire after fire. And we must start going directly to the right source. What is the right source? James gives us this this conclusion as he moves from chapter 3 into chapter 4 in verses 1 and 2. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Now, what's a fight and a quarrel? They're words. That's how we fight. That's how we quarrel. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? 
with that fire inside, with that unstable bomb. You desire, but you don't have, so you kill, you covet, but you can't get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. What's the right source if that's what we're supposed to be finding? The right source is God himself. You don't ask God, you quarrel and fight, the unstable bomb blows up in your face time and time again. Why? Because you're talking to all the wrong sources and you're pulling from all the wrong sources. And we never bring our things, our difficulties, our problems, and our complaints to the right source. And the right source is God himself. We complain to everybody else. We gripe to everybody else. We spew our negativity to everybody else. And we draw from a poisonous well and we inject that poison into anyone within earshot. And when we do, the fire only grows and it never seems to get extinguished. If that's happening in your life, it's time to change your well. And the next time you feel that negative comment rising up inside of you, you're going to draw from a new well. And instead of heading to the nearest person within earshot who's going to hear about your negativity and your complaint, you're going to head to your prayer room and pour out all that negativity on the one who can actually make a difference in your life, on Jesus himself. You can bring anything to God. It'll It'll never cease to confuse me why we believe we have to hold back our words when we talk to God. That we have to say things just right or get things just right or word it just right. Because we believe if we come to God and we say X, Y, then we'll get Z. If we plug in just the right words with just the right formula, then we'll get just the right outcome. No, that's not the way it is. God already knows everything you're thinking and feeling. He already has heard everything that's rolled through your head, and he knows every emotion you're already experiencing. So when you get down on your hands and knees with God, don't hold anything back. Let it all go. I'm willing to listen to any complaint you have, but I have one caveat. Bring it to God first before you bring it to me. Bring it to God first before you come to the person next to you or the person down the hall or your coworker or your neighbor or whoever. Bring it to God first. That's the well we go to. If we're drawing from any other well, if we're pulling from any other source, he's the only one that can put out all the fires that are already raging in your life. Now, after saying these things, I fear that every time you all see me, you're going to feel like you can't even give the slightest hint of negativity. Maybe I'm okay with that. Maybe I should just leave that there. It's not necessarily what we're shooting for. We're wanting to change our attitude through changing our source. It doesn't mean we'll never speak a negative word. It doesn't mean we'll never disagree with something that takes place. It doesn't mean you'll never truly share something with a trusted confidant that seems negative towards someone or something or some situation. I met with our board this week, and the first rule was, tell it like it is. Don't be afraid to say what you actually see. This is how we get to places with one another. We have to be honest and open and transparent, but only if you've brought it to God first and made sure that if the fire is set on course, By hell, you don't continue to let it burn in everyone else around you. I don't mind hearing your complaint, but make sure you've brought it to God first. Praise team, would you come back? Our kids were, I don't know, four or five. We were driving, I think, to Florida, uh, heading for a vacation at one point. And Jake was maybe five years old. He was right behind me in the seat as I was driving, and he was talking to Christy. And I remember at one point in the conversation, he, he, he started asking mom questions about me. And I just started listening, wondering, what's he doing? And I remember, I don't remember all of the questions, but I remember one of the questions he asked mom while I was sitting right in front of him is, Mom, what's dad's favorite cookie? And she turned around and looked at him and, and, and with fire raging from her eyes, said, he's right there. Ask him, why are you talking to me? Mothers know this pain. They come to you with all the questions. Dad never has to answer anything, and I'm sitting right in front of him. He wants to know my favorite cookie, and he's asking my wife, who's right next to me. She has to tell him, ask him. He's right there. Oatmeal raisin, by the way. 
I feel like this is so often how we bring things to God. It, 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 we treat the world like, like, like mom, and we treat God like dad. And we bring all of our stuff to the one who has no answers, and we never bring it to the one who has all the answers. The world's not going to give you the right answer. The world's not going to do anything to help you put out the fire that's raging in your life. The world is not going to help you steer your ship in the right direction. Only God can do that. So stop bringing everything to the wrong source and bring it all to God himself. Lay it all down at his feet. Isaiah 6, we looked at, I think, back in January. If you want to flip there very quickly with me, we'll conclude there. In Isaiah 6, you have Isaiah's commissioning. It's a moment when God shows up in Isaiah's life and he tells him, you're going to be a prophet for me. It's time for you to go speak my words. And it opens with Isaiah having a vision of the Lord seated on a throne in Isaiah 6. And he sees some angels and they're they're flying through the air and they're crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And in the midst of that temple, there's a fire burning. There's smoke filling the entire temple that he sees in this vision. And he says in verse 5, woe is me, I am ruined. If you remember in the original language, that word can mean I am silenced. The first response he had as he saw this wonderful image before him, he said, my words are ending. I can't speak. And then he makes it more clear. For I am a man of unclean lips. As he encounters the presence of God, he realizes the first, the first thing he comes to, the first idea he comes to as he encounters the presence of God is, oh no, my words have not been what they should be. I am a man of unclean lips. Woe is me, I'm silent, Lord. And he does all this because in a few moments, God is going to say, it's time for you to start talking again, Isaiah. And now you're going to share my words instead of your own. You're going to talk cleanly instead of dirty. But in the midst of that, he says, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. And he makes an observation about everyone else around him. He says, I live amongst the people of unclean lips. It wasn't just about him. It was about the world he lived in. And I want to tell you today, we live in a world with unclean lips today. More so than perhaps any other time of all of history. There are more words available to you right now with the click of that little thing in your pocket and that some of you are looking at even at this very moment. You can click that and find an endless amount of words. And there are not many of them there to edify you. They're meant to keep the fire in your life burning in all the wrong places. But oh, Isaiah, when he saw this smoke filling this glory-filled cloud, this glory-filled temple, and he realized I'm a man of unclean lips and I live in a world of unclean lips, what happened next is the angel went over to the fire that was burning in the middle of that temple, in the middle of all that smoke, and he picked up one of those those coals, hot coals from that altar and he walked over to Isaiah and he touched his lips and suddenly the right fire started to burn in Isaiah's mouth. James tells us there's 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 a little propane thing in the back of your mouth. There's a little light in the back of your mouth going on, and it's lit lit by hell itself. But God says, if you'll just give that to me, if you'll stop pulling from the right source, I can come and touch that lip, and I can touch that mouth, and I can change the course of your life. Because the right fire will start to burn. Stand with me. Oh, God. Let the right fire start to burn within us. I have felt in the past few weeks, there are a lot of churches you can go to that will hype you up, that will leave you in a shout. There's a whole smorgasbord of churches you can pick from in our area. 
we can come into this place and we raise the shout and we raise the worship and we, we proclaim our praise to God. And I'm thankful for those moments. I'm thankful for those opportunities when we can do that. But if the only kind of Christian we're developing in this church is one who will come in when we gather together and worship God aloud, but then walk out and Monday through Saturday and just leave all of their stuff everywhere else, start all the wrong fires, then I'm failing. The opening verse said, I'm going to be judged more strictly as your teacher. When we come into this place, it's my responsibility, I believe, to, enter, to offer the ability to enter into the presence of God through worship and word. But there's so much more to what I have to do for you than just that. It's my job to open up this word to you and represent God to you in such a way that you're going to want to leave this place and continue to walk in his presence and continue to walk in his word and continue to live out all of his ways in your life. It's not just about what we're doing here. It's about all we do when we leave here. So I'm challenging you today. It's not just about what you say to your fellow Christian sitting next to you in the chair or the pew or at work. It's about all the stuff you say to this world and all the things that are falling out of your mouth day in and day out that are hindering the voice of God in their lives and in yours. I'm asking us today to just take a moment and repent of all of the things we've said that have done damage to God himself and to the course of my life and the course of the lives of others. Oh God, would you just bow your head to him right now? Father, none of us are innocent. We're all guilty, Lord. I'm guilty, Father. But Lord, I repent and ask you to change the course of my life by changing the course of my words. Would you find a place of prayer now as we begin to worship and just take a few moments and just cry out to God where you can you stay where you are. You can go to the back corner. You can come to the front. I don't care where you go. Just find a few minutes with God and say, God, take my tongue. And as you did with Isaiah, touch it with the coal from your fire and set it on fire from heaven and no longer from hell, O oh Lord. Find a place of prayer. Let's talk to him.
rushing wind, fire of God fall within. Holy Ghost, breathe on us, we pray. As we repent, turn from sin, revival in your smoke. i
your goodness and your mercy and your grace. It is always so rich toward us and always so free. Thank you for all the moments we've got it wrong when you've come in and you've made it right. Because, Lord, that's how good you are to us. And I pray that for all the things that we've already got wrong, that you would begin to turn the tide of those, I pray, O oh Lord. And that your grace and your mercy would overwhelm every situation. The fires we've started, would you put them out, Lord? Would the water of the Holy Spirit be poured out on the fires that we've already begun? Even those we've begun unknowingly, unwittingly, just based on the fact that we're in a fallen world. Would you put them all out and extinguish them all by the grace and mercy found in Jesus Christ, our Lord? And give us the grace and the mercy to start no more, oh God, in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll consider joining us again at 5 o'clock tonight right here as David Riggs brings the word. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. This may be too daring of a prayer to pray how thou, but would you sing those orphans home? Ready, we can see them coming now, just like the prodigal. 